Hi everyone, thanks for listening to my presentations. The other time I talked about Wadestrom macroglobulinemia, and I made a promise that I will be publishing the treatment just a few days after the first one. That's exactly what I'll be doing today. So, without wasting your time, let's go straight and have a look at different ways to treat Wadestrom macroglobulinemia. You are not the doctor of yourself, please contact your physician. Okay, thank you. What well, is strong macroglobulinemia treatment? The treatment will start from the confirmation of the diagnosis. Let's be sure this is true WM. Okay, and then we need to determine the extent of the disease or its severity. And is this individual having other comorbid situations or situations like heart defect somewhere, kidney failure before now, or having COPD or anything? We need to find out because what does from macroglobinemia can affect almost all organs, including the central nervous system. Then we need to determine how active this individual is. We are going to find out, are we dealing with upper viscosity because that is part of the problems we'll be dealing with when it comes to WM. And remember, WM means what is strong, macroglobulinemia. So when there is upper viscosity, we want to find out any bleeding gums, epistasis, visual problems, headache, dizziness, and have we done the IgM assay? Is it greater than 3,000 mg per DL? If that is the case, we need to have fundoscopy done. So, we are not going to treat just everybody, but we must treat some people, right? Like I've said the other time, my first uh, presentation on Wadestro Macroglobinemia that it might be small drain, WM, that is indolent or asymptomatic. Now, we have to treat if there is associated fever, night nice sweats, weight loss, fatigue, or upper viscosity, giving us bleeding gums, epistasis, ocular problems, headache, or dizziness. And we have to treat if we are dealing with lymphadenopathy, symptomatic hepatomegaly, symptomatic splenomegaly, organ or tissue infiltration, peripheral neuropathy, cryoglobulinemia with renal phenomena, particular and likes, cold agglutinin hemolytic anemia when you do the Coombs test, and of course thrombocytopenia that will lead to bleeding. We have to treat when we are dealing with nephropathy because I said it could damage the kidney and when we are dealing with amyloidosis that could destroy so many organs, we have to treat. Hemoglobin of 10 grams per DL or less, we have to transfuse when the platelet count is very low. At 100 or less, we have to treat. If it's symptomatic, like smoldering, wadestrom, microglobulinemia, we may not treat, but we have to be following up. And we do that every four to six months. Then we will be running complete blood count while we're doing this. And we will assay for monoclonal protein levels. Yeah, different situation will determine what we do. So if we're running to very serious problem, then we have to use emergent plasma pheresis. Plasma pheresis, as a case of emergency, will be required when we are dealing with hyperviscosity, associated with bleeding, blood vision, headache, dizziness, or we're dealing with paresthesia, retinal vein engorgement, flame-shaped hemorrhages, papillo edema, stupor, or the affected WM patient is even in coma. 
we can administer rituzima with chemotherapy if we're dealing with low tumor burden or we're dealing with minimal symptoms. Remember, this is different from emergency situation where we use plasma viruses, right? We may use rituzima alone or we may add chemotherapy to the rituzima. Cyclophosphamide could be added you know, to rituzima with desametazone. We can use rituzima with bendamustine if we are dealing with high tumor body with or without moderate to severe symptoms. Hematopoietic cell transplantation is possible also. We'll discuss with those in the center. The prognosis, I cannot just say good or bad, depending on the level of microglobulin. So we're going to use beta 2 microglobulin level to determine the prognosis. In stage 1, that is low risk. Beta 2 microglobulin less than 3 mg per liter and hemoglobin greater than 12.0 gram per DL will have five year survival rate at the level of 87%. That's pretty good, right? But I don't wish anybody will have it, all right? Stage B, that is medium risk. Be that two microglobulin level less than three milligram per liter, hemoglobin level less than 12.0 gram per DL and five years of average is about 63%. Still on prognosis, stage C, state tag median risk. But here, beta 2 M will be greater than 3 milligram per liter. You can now see that it's greater than 3 milligram per liter. Serum IgM greater than 4 gram per DL and the survival rate here at 5 year will be 53%, that is lower. Stage D is high risk. B2M greater than 3 milligram per liter, IgM less than 4 gram per DL and 5 year survival rate is 21%, the least. The follow up should be done appropriately. Um, it could be any time from three to six months every year. Now three to six months, every three to six months, depending on how convenient that would be for you and the patient. Okay, with that, I've come to the end of this very presentation. Kindly subscribe to my channel so that you can get all my presentations immediately they're published. I appreciate it. Thank you.